Tonight, moving past the pandemic, why this factory in West Lothian could provide us with COVID vaccines for years to come. Whether or not the UK is going to take this vaccine, I hope so. The number of patients in hospital with COVID hits record levels yet again. Also making the headlines, could a reprieve for P&O's sack seafarers be on the cards? New government action could force a U-turn. Concerns that Ukrainian refugees coming to Scotland are at risk of being exploited by criminals. I'm Andrea Brimer in Edinburgh. And I'm John Mackay in Glasgow. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. Annual vaccines against coronavirus could become a way of life in a future of living with COVID, much as we do for flu. A state-of-the-art vaccine manufacturing facility in West Lothian could play a key role in providing them. The chief executive of Valneva, which is commissioning the site in Livingston, has told STV News he still hopes to supply the immunisation to the UK. That's despite a UK government contract for 100 million doses being terminated. Here's our senior reporter, Gordon Cree. We are working very, very hard in um, attracting talent, growing the site. He's keeping a close eye on developments at this plant. It's one of only a handful worldwide able to make what are called inactivated whole virus vaccines. And the boss of Valneva told me that could be vital as COVID evolves into the post-pandemic era. This vaccine technology has the possibility to be adopted for new variants um, and it has also shown a um, good level of cross-protection and longevity, which is important for future vaccination policies. Whether or not the UK is going to take this vaccine, I hope so. That's a reference to last year's cancellation by the UK government of a deal to supply coronavirus vaccines. But now with regulatory approval drawing nearer and the realisation annual doses may be needed, there's a new optimism. Over the next few months, they'll be getting this facility fully up and running. And that means in years to come, it potentially can produce millions of doses of vaccines for COVID and other conditions. An investment of up to £20 million from Scottish Enterprise has helped push things forward here. Today, the First Minister met staff at the site. Obviously, with any vaccine, uh, there are approval and regulatory processes that have to be gone through. But investing here gives us uh, more choice for the future and it also helps to build a manufacturing facility here that will support jobs and economic activity. Although intensive care patients remain low, the number of people in Scottish hospitals with COVID hit a new high again today. It means for shoppers in Aberdeen and the rest of us, masks could remain for a while longer when we get this week's update. They shouldn't really, because as I say, people have been ignoring it. Yeah, but it should be choice rather than you must. It's still going around the virus and I think it's important we all protect ourselves. It's largely because of vaccines that the virus is no longer doing the harm it once did, even with high case numbers. The backers of this factory believe in the longer term, it boosts our ability to keep it that way. Gordon Cree, STV News, Livingston. A package of measures from the UK government will block P&O Ferries' plan to replace 800 seafarers with agency workers paid below the minimum wage. The company caused outrage after sacking its crew with no notice on the 17th of March. The P&O Chief Executive Peter Hebblethwaite, whose basic annual salary is £325,000, told MPs last week the average pay of the agency crew is £5.50 per hour. Ollie Dickinson reports. A little over a week from the sacking of 800 P&O ferry staff, the anger remains. Reinstate! Today, more than 100 union protesters were here at the headquarters of Clyde Marine Recruitment. A company demonstrators allege have supplied staff to replace some of the sacked workers. Clyde Marine deny this, but declined to answer any questions on camera today. We are here to call on them to take a step back 
not to get involved, don't go down in history as being part of one of the most ferocious attacks on working people that's ever been conducted in this country. If P and O and the bandit capitalists get away with us, who's next? Nobody's job will be safe. We need employment law tightened up in this country because this despicable dismissal of 800 people via video call is not going to become the norm. This morning, in a letter to the boss of P&O Ferries, Peter Hebblethwaite, the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, accused the boss of demonstrating contempt for his staff. He said his position as both chief executive and a company director was untenable and called on the company to immediately re-employ the 800 fired workers. P&O must face the consequences for their actions. We are looking at every tool that is available to the government. Uh, we're doing that uh, as fast as is humanly possible. The Secretary of State's uh, letter that he's written has been absolutely clear uh, of what view we take of the actions that P&O have uh, taken, uh, and we will be, uh, we'll be acting uh, upon that. As hundreds of workers face another uncertain week, unions say this is just the beginning of their fight. They plan to blockade the port of Cairn Ryan next month. Ollie Dickinson, STV News. The First Minister has denied a contract for two ferries was washed through for political reasons. It follows comments from the former boss of the Ferguson Marine Shipyard. The vessels, which are meant to serve the Clyde and Hebrides, are now almost four years late. Last week, an Audit Scotland report said the contracts were approved despite not having full refund guarantees. There are, have been real problems uh, with the construction of these vessels, the delays to the completion of the vessels, the cost overruns, deeply unsatisfactory, and lots of lessons to be learned there. But as I think the Audit Scotland report itself said, uh, there was nothing untoward in the procurement of the, the contract at the time. The fallout from the Chancellor's mini-budget continued today as Rishi Sunak was grilled by MPs. With gas and electricity bills set to soar from next week, he came under pressure from those who feel he hasn't done enough to help the poorest. Well, live now to our Westminster correspondent, Catherine Sampson. Catherine, was there any sign today that the Chancellor might do more? Um, not straight away, uh, no. Now, Rishi Sunak today was really mounting a defence of his spring statement. You'll remember last week he did cut fuel duty, he did change the thresholds at which we start to pay national insurance if we're in work. Um, however, there were many MPs who really feel this doesn't meet the scale of the crisis. They wanted him to do more. He said today he is monitoring the situation. He will act if necessary if energy bills are to rise in the autumn. So a fairly strong signal, I think, to households there. Don't expect more help from the Chancellor until at least that point. Clearly it is very difficult to sit here today and speculate on what happens to energy prices, therefore the biggest impact on living standards in the autumn. Let's wait until we get there and then can decide on the most appropriate course of action. But I don't think anyone today knows what that appropriate course of action ought to be. Um, yeah, I mean, to sum up then, you've made a political choice to plunge 1.3 million people, including half a million children, into absolute poverty. On the figures we have now, that is what you've chosen to do in your spring state. No, what, I, what I've chosen to do is ameliorate, uh, on average, a third of the impact on living standards from forces that are clearly outside of my control. Well, meanwhile, the UK government's long-awaited energy strategy has been delayed again. First promised to be published by uh, the Prime Minister uh, three weeks ago. This is the plan to try and wean the UK off dependence on oil and gas from abroad, of course, especially uh, from Russia. There have been some speculation perhaps the holds up is due to costs, and it's the Treasury that's behind it. Rishi Sunak denied that today, saying he's not blocking anything. It's moving at pace. They're just trying to get the final details right. All right, Catherine from London, thank you. Anti-trafficking organisations are warning that Ukrainian refugees coming to Scotland are at risk of being exploited by criminals if the correct safeguarding measures are not in place. Concerns have been raised over the potential for criminals to exploit the super sponsor and Homes for Ukraine schemes where members of the public can host refugees in their homes. The Scottish Government say extra disclosure checks are in place to ensure the well-being and safety of those arriving. As Louise Hosey reports. 
By the time many Ukrainian refugees get to the border, they're exhausted, searching for safety and sanctuary after escaping the horrors of war. It's so dangerous. We are so afraid to live now in Ukraine. Now there are fears that this mass movement of women and children could give criminals the perfect opportunity to capitalise on their vulnerability. Refugees who want to come to Scotland can apply through the country's super sponsor and the UK-wide Homes for Ukraine scheme, where members of the public offer to host refugees in their homes. Vetting procedures are in place, but there are still concerns that this could lead to a rise in human trafficking and other exploitation. Already there's evidence of traffickers targeting refugees at Ukraine's border crossings. If you are a woman with children who is traumatised, frightened, has been separated from her family and her husband. We've got concerns there that that's an opportunity for traffickers and predators to say, I can assist you. More than 8,000 people in Scotland have already expressed an interest in welcoming Ukrainian refugees to their homes. But the hosting scheme brings its own specific concerns. What happens um, if, if that hosting system and sponsorship system is infiltrated by traffickers and then used to their advantage? People have been so incredibly generous and it's obvious that we want to do something and we do want to welcome and it's from the best place, but there's a risks associated with that. And um, there will be people that will take advantage of that. Another issue is the number of unregulated groups appearing on social media which offer to match up hosts and refugees. Matching your own refugee, find a refugee on social media, is sends shivers down my spine, to be honest, in terms of safeguarding. Another concern is the increasing number of children now travelling alone. One group says obstructive UK visa restrictions are leading to some people taking riskier routes. It's gravely concerning to have children on our database right now who are talking about travelling and having to have conversations with their mothers and them to convince them not to travel when they are in a war zone. People will now start putting up fake pages on Facebook and say, I'll take you in. They're going on to groups and social media that we don't know about to say, yes, we will take families in or I'll take your daughter, I'll take your son, not knowing precisely who that is. Would we take that route for our children? I don't think we would. There are also worries that a current UK labour shortage provides a fertile breeding ground for criminals. That's when the, the crime fraternity, if you like, will exploit them. They will always find a way. So we've seen it on an increase already, post-Brexit, post-pandemic, and this crisis will only make it worse. The Scottish Government says it wants Scotland to be a welcoming and safe haven and that ensuring the safety of those coming here from Ukraine is critical. A spokesperson added that enhanced disclosure checks were in place for sponsors, which offered the same level of scrutiny as initial checks carried out for those working with children and vulnerable adults. The UK government said those offering to house Ukrainians would be subject to home office checks before any visa was issued. Louise Hosey, STV News. Other stories across Scotland and evidence from police officers at a public inquiry into the death of Sheku Bayou could be used to prosecute them in future, according to the Crown. Mr Bayou died in police custody in 2015 after being restrained by officers in Kirkcaldy. Lawyers for 12 officers wanted a guarantee that their remarks to the inquiry would not be used against them, but this has been rejected by the Solicitor General. The inquiry is due to start on the 10th of May. A pensioner has been charged with racially abusing a footballer at a Highland League match. The 84-year-old man is accused of making remarks towards a Huntley FC player during their nil-all draw with Keith on Saturday. The game was stopped by the referee. Two people whose remains are among 14 bodies found in a Roman bathhouse may have come from the other side of medieval Scotland. New research has found that some of the group may have travelled east to make the Cramond area their home. The remains were discovered near Edinburgh in 1975 and have been traced back to the 6th century. A third of parents living in Scotland say their diet has become less healthy since the start of the pandemic, with a further 17% saying their children's diet has also been negatively affected. A report by Food Standards Scotland found that Scots were snacking more and also relying more on fast food and takeaways. 
And one in four children in Scotland are worried about their family having enough money to live comfortably. That's according to the charity Action for Children, which is calling on the Scottish Government to do more to support those on the lowest incomes. Now, whether it's bin collection, schools or social care, Scotland's councils are responsible for delivering a wide range of vital services. But with continuous cuts to their budgets and a pandemic to recover from, there are stark warnings that local authorities face a financially unstable future. With local elections fast approaching, our political reporter Laura Alderman has been taking a look at what the key issues are for voters in Glasgow and Edinburgh. What you see standing beside me is a symbol that the city has become. When reports of rats in Glasgow's rubbish collided with a global climate conference last year, what was a local issue became national news. And refuse collectors in the city are about to go on strike. Now Scots will vote on how those local issues are handled as council elections take place in just over five weeks' time. But it could be an uphill struggle for local authorities who face face a financially uncertain future. There's been a long-term decline in the money that has gone to local authorities, along with an increase in the kind of things they are expected to do, both by residents and indeed by the Scottish Government. So councils have been squeezed, they've had to make some very difficult decisions and that will just continue to go ahead. Council elections never really set the heather alight. At the last one in 2017, voter turnout was only around 47%, and in the one before that, it was less than 40%. But over the last two years, with the pandemic and lockdown, many more of us have spent much more time in our local communities, and local issues have never been more important. So what are the burning issues for voters in Scotland's two biggest cities? The roads, pavements, places this filthy, things are not being actually kept up to date. It's quite a lot of potholes and stuff, so like when you're driving, like you just go into the potholes and it's damaging your cars and stuff. So Litter and rubbish is around there as well, a lot of noise. Far more regular uplift of the recycling bin rather than the ordinary waste bin. The local roads, it can be quite bad for potholes and things as well. So, yeah, better quality of the parks and the roads, really. And for those who cover comings and goings at the city chambers, there's a realisation that whoever wins has a tough task ahead of them. Tens of millions have been wiped off their budget and they have to find savings every year. At a time when demand for council services is increasing because of the pandemic, and that's going to continue for the next five years. We need more bins, get the bins back, roadworks, I'm sick of roadworks, constant roadworks. I feel like the trash cans get really full fast. <laughs> Rental prices are really high and like for students, I'm a student, so for students it's really hard to find housing every year. The bins have been piling up and up and we've seen a lot of trash on the streets which we don't really love to see, yeah. honestly. More kind of cycle paths as well, I guess. Ballots are usually cast along party lines, but in Edinburgh especially, often local issues can swing votes. The best example of that was in 2012 when uh, we were at the height of the trams uh, fiasco in Edinburgh. And the Lib Dems, who had been the biggest party and leading the, the council, um, they were reduced suddenly from 17 seats to just three. Election day is the 5th of May, and for candidates in our two biggest cities, the stakes have never been higher. Laura Alderman, STV News in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Residents of a building that was evacuated following storms in January say they have been left out of home and out of pocket. People with flats in Trinity Tower in Glasgow's West End have been in temporary accommodation for two months, despite an engineer's report saying the risk of the tower collapsing is low. Sasha Spratt reports. Back in January, storm at Malik swept across the country causing damage and disruption. The high winds thrashing the side of Trinity Tower highlighted the fragility of the structure. Hundreds of residents were forced to flee after engineers called for the building to be evacuated. Two months on and families are still in temporary accommodation. Rosemary's disabled son is struggling with the upheaval. I don't actually know how much he understands it. I can't bring him here because he gets too upset. I can't take him anywhere near it. I can't, I've got to be really careful. He was here one day, but he was upset at leaving. If I had certainty, if I knew, even if it was not exactly then, if it was going to be a, a little bit later, then I could plan, then I could let him know. I write out stories for him to 
to see what's going to happen in the future. I can't do that. He, can't, he hasn't even got, he's got no certainty in his life at the moment. A significant amount of work has gone into assessing the structural integrity of this tower and now two key reports have been published on the Glasgow Council website. The first is from the day after the evacuation which says that there is a high risk of full collapse of the tower. The second is from less than a month later which says there is in fact a low risk of full collapse and this has left residents increasingly frustrated. How has this been allowed to happen? What is really being done to make sure that date of 28th is kept? And what degree of assurance are we going to have that this is never going to happen again? And while we're considering those three questions, we're all thousands of pounds out of pocket from short-term accommodation and rent that we've had to find and pay on top of our mortgages already. So there's a degree of frustration in a number of levels. Glasgow Council must sign off on the safety of the building before anyone can stay there again. And despite the change in opinion from structural engineers, the authority says their assessment that the structure is unsafe has not changed, as both reports highlighted areas of concern. Works are now being carried out on behalf of the residents in the hope they will be back in their own homes by the end of April. Sasha Spratt, STV News, Glasgow. Let's go to the sport now. Here's Raman. Get your fill of the action. STV Sports, sponsored by Papa John's Pizza. Good evening. Steve Clark says Lyndon Dykes is fit to play his part in Scotland's friendly against Austria, even though the striker hasn't featured for QPR for six weeks. Andy Robertson also returns and Clark admits he'll make full use of the players at his disposal for tomorrow's game. Here's Sheila McLaren. Lyndon Dykes was back training with his Scotland teammates after missing Thursday's friendly with Poland. He's been sidelined for over a month at QPR with a hamstring problem and his club manager Mark Warburton didn't think he'd be fit for the national side. But Steve Clark insists he's ready to be involved tomorrow night. We discussed the issue before the camp and then we were guided by QPR. They allowed Lyndon to come up and join us to watch the Poland game. He's done a couple of training sessions since and he's good to go. It doesn't have much riding on except that you're playing for your country and you want to win. We want to continue the, the run that we're on uh, and obviously the the key games are still in front of us. The competitive matches in June are, are going to be massive for the country and everybody wants to be involved which is great. Captain Andy Robertson also returns to the fold after illness and despite his heavy end-of-season schedule with Liverpool, there was no chance of him missing this one. You know, I don't want to be sitting in my house if I don't, if I don't have to be. Um, you know, I'm fit, I'm well and um, I look forward to, to the games. I love coming away to here and I love playing games with Scotland and meeting up with the boys and, um, you know, obviously being captain and everything like that, so... You know, I'm looking forward to you know hopefully another cap tomorrow, and um, and then you know we'll, we'll, we'll go back to Liverpool fresh and um, you know good to go for the running. Tomorrow's match will be the last for Austria boss Franco Foda, who announced he would be stepping down following their World Cup playoff defeat to Wales. It's always disappointing when you hear a manager's lost his job. I, th- I think Franco's done a gr- done a good job for his national team. They got they got to the Euro 2020. Uh, they pushed early all the way in the knockout phase. So. I think he can be proud of the work that he's done. Scotland have travelled to Vienna on a seven-game unbeaten run and the manager and his players are looking to keep that going before the competitive games resume in June. To golf and June Ferguson says years and years of hard work is paying off as he won the Qatar Masters to claim his first European Tour title. The Scot carded a two under par 70 in his final round, which included an eagle and a birdie in his final three holes to finish on seven under par, one shot ahead of Chase Hanna. Incredible, everything I'd ever hoped for, to be honest. And I think just all the waiting to try and go over the line, the way I finished was just like so worth it. Uh, that putt on the last and that chipping on 16, you know, I went from having a tough start uh, which I've done before playing with being in contention and then, but I just knew if I can stay around, stay around, stay around because one birdie when the weather's so tough just moves you so far up there. Very well done. Tennis and Cameron Norrie is on course to break into the top 10 of the ATP rankings for the first time. Norrie, who is ranked 12th at the moment, progressed to the last 16 of the Miami Open following his straight sets win over Hugo Gaston. He'll face Kasparud for a place in the quarterfinals. 
Rugby and Glasgow Warriors head coach Danny Wilson says there's no need to hit the panic button. That's after his side surrendered a strong lead to lose to Cardiff. The Warriors were 28-15 ahead with 25 minutes to go but lost 32-28. Their next match is at home to Zebra on Friday night. It's not a case of hitting the panic button. We got two points out of that game away from home. Um, we certainly targeted it as a winnable game and I know we'll look back at it and, and believe we maybe dropped two or three out there which could be important later in the season but we'll see. But we're back to a home game here. Our home record has been outstanding this season and we'll want that to continue with a home win at Scotston. Finally, the ice hockey and Glasgow clan suffered back-to-back -back defeats at the weekend. After their 4-2 loss to Coventry Blaze, they went down 3-2 to five flyers last night. The clan host league leaders Belfast Giants tomorrow night. And that is all the sport from me tonight, folks. I'll see you again tomorrow. Get your fill of the action. STV Sports, sponsored by Papa John's Pizza. Well, that was the summer, and as Philip now tells us, winter is coming back. Hello, good evening. Well, we mentioned it last week, and you may have seen or heard that there is some snow on the way, which is incredible considering the conditions that we've had lately, but it's hopefully not going to be very significant or disruptive. Yes, we have this plume of cold air that's moving in from the north over the next couple of days, and this means that any showers that we do see will be falling as sleet or snow, predominantly on higher ground, but also down to lower levels. However, because of the warm conditions and high temperatures lately, it means surface temperatures are quite high and any lying snow shouldn't last long. We'll look into this further through the rest of the week, but in the meantime, let's take a look at the next couple of days. Here is the forecast. A light drizzle is coming in from the west. Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. Well, as we head through the rest of this evening and overnight, for most of us generally it will remain dry. We will see some clear spells and that allows some mist and fog patches to form through the central belt. We'll also see some low cloud rolling in from the North Sea affecting the coasts. Temperature wise, under the clearest conditions, getting down to minus one or minus two. For most towns and cities though, dropping to lows of around five or six degrees Celsius. Now looking ahead to tomorrow, it will be a cloudier start to the day particularly compared to what we've seen over the past few days. Those mist and fog patches will eventually burn off. By mid-morning, we'll see a veil of thicker clouds spreading in from the north ahead of this cold front that's moving in. And by the afternoon, that cloud will be thick enough to spark off one or two isolated and quite heavy showers, mostly around western and southern areas. Temperature-wise, down a few degrees from today, highs of 12 or 13 degrees Celsius. And those temperatures will continue to drop as we head through Wednesday and Thursday. Tuesday, highs of 12. Wednesday, highs of only 5 degrees Celsius. But picking up again as we head towards the weekend. Looking ahead to Wednesday, and overall we'll have a mixture of sunny spells and and scattered showers. It will be cold enough that some of those showers will be falling as sleet and snow, but predominantly on higher ground across the north and northeast. Here in the west, a drier and brighter day to come with highs of five. Bye bye. Tui Blue Hotels, sponsor STV Weather. That's it. I'll be back with Scotland tonight at 10.40, looking at the ferries fiasco. Rishi Sunak appearing before MPs, and that's slap in Hollywood. Indeed, and uh, John and I will both be back same time, same place tomorrow. We'll see you then. Good night. Good night.